everybody and welcome to a brand new edition of ring respect radio right here on the video bros network i am bobby munson and i'm joined as always by the man with the angelic voice you know him he's papa folks. how you doing sir yeah i'm doing good munson how are all my wrestling people doing out there hope everybody's doing well staying healthy feeling good and back to some live pro wrestling action papa folks. we ourselves and back to the live pro wrestling action we couldn't be happier about it and we're going to be talking about some live pro wrestling action here today. Not that we attended in person, but that we watched on the old YouTube channel. Uh, so MLW Fusion Alpha, we're a couple of weeks behind there, Pops Most. We got two of them to catch up on. So we're going to cover both episode seven and episode eight here today on the show. But before we do, we're going to ask you guys to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Hit that notification bell. So, you know, anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. That being said, we also want you to go ahead and check out Backbreaker Media, our good friends of Al out of Alberta who have been sponsoring our show and getting us out on all sorts of platforms. And also a big shout out to the Canadian Wrestling Network as well, too. Great supporters of us right here on Ring Respect Radio. And considering the foul mouth language that we tend to have here sometimes on this program, I'm surprised they still want to be our friends and keep us in the loop here, Papa Smokes. But hey, all the power to them for uh, not, having, not having us censored at this point. Well, we're not that bad. We we say it how it is. That's true. That's true. So speaking of saying how it is, it's time to get right down to it, Pop Smokes. We're going to start with the MLW Fusion Alpha episode number seven. Uh, as we are recording this, they will be going on to Alpha on Thanksgiving, I believe, happens tomorrow night, uh, Wednesday night. This is a Tuesday that we're recording, and that one is going to have the War Chamber match. So a lot to talk to leading up into there, uh, starting with episode seven of the program. Uh, so this one started off with uh, Cesar Duran inside the middle of the ring. Uh, he said that he is missing a human sacrifice. That's what he wants, and he wants to ask the Renegades who they want to see sacrificed in the middle of that ring tonight. Then all of a sudden, boom, 5150 comes on out. And the uh, commentators reiterated the uh, past tensions between Conan and Cesar Duran as well from the history of those two guys. Uh, one line I really liked uh, back and forth between Conan and Cesar Duran in this one was when Cesar Duran asked Conan, are you guys high on glue or something? And Conan turns around, no, sir, we are high on weed. Great, great start there. Uh, 5150 laying out a challenge to Los Parks and then Los Parks coming down. Uh, essentially, I'm assuming a, accepting said challenge as a fight breaks out between the two teams. Um, interesting opening segment. What do you think there, Pop Smokes? Yeah, I like this. And I mean, they're they're making the best of this wild crowd they have in Philly for this last set of tapings. I think it's a good uh, idea to play off of that crowd and to give them some stuff to react to. So this is all good. And we saw some wild brawling in this uh, taping as well. And, and the, you know that those uh, former ECW fans in Philly are going to be loving that. You bet they will. So, yeah, all hell broke out. And it looks like we're going to be getting that match sooner rather than later between Los Parks and 5150 for the MLW Tag Team Champions Championship. I believe, uh, yeah, 5150 have staked their claim and nobody's coming out to say, hey, otherwise. So we're going to get this match. We've been talking about it, looking forward to it. Uh, should be a good one. So from there, we uh, have Filthy Tom Waller come out to confront Cesar Duran. I doubt Filthy Tom Waller coming out to talk about how he's been screwed lately in MLW. He was screwed in his match against Alexander Hammerstone for the National Openweight Championship. He was screwed in his match against Davey Richards for the 2021 Opera Cup. He wants a main event title fight. He wants it as soon as possible. He demands it. Cesar Duran says, you're going to get it, sir. You're getting it tonight. And it's going to be a casket match for the Caribbean Championship against King Huertes. What a uh, turn of events there, Pop Smokes. What do you think of this one? Absolutely. And Caesar Duran being the main matchmaker on MLW is always busy. 
his office is like a rotating door of wrestlers coming in and out, asking for favors, asking for matches, asking what Duran has for them in the future. So uh, Filthy Tom Lawler, the latest guy to do that. And uh, I, I liked one of his lines uh, in this exchange too, where he said, I'm a prize fighter, damn it. It's, it's about time I'm treated like one. Yeah. And that just calls back to his MMA experience and all that and his UFC fights and when you look at it that way, he's got kind of a point and, and Duran's got to do something for him. So, yeah, like you said, he got the match, the championship match that he asked for, except that it's probably not the one he was exactly looking for. King Muerte is in a casket match. Ooh, that's 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 a tough one. And uh, Lawler did not look like he was happy with that. Not at all. I can't imagine anyone being happy being put into a casket match. And been a while since I've seen the casket match being utilized as well, too. Very uh, synonymous with The Undertaker, of course, seeing a lot of casket matches back in his day. Uh, do you remember the last time outside of an Undertaker match you've seen the casket match being invoked in pro wrestling? I I think the last one I would have seen was Undertaker versus Yokozuna, so it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, I think you might have had one with Mankind in there somewhere, too. I can't quite remember, uh, but, uh, you know, Tell us in the comment section below or uh, maybe share some of those casket matches with us in the comment section below if you have access to them as well, too. But I uh, think the announcers later do mention this is the first and only ever casket match used in MLW history. So history being made tonight on MLW Fusion Alpha 7. Uh, so we're going to finally kick off with some in-ring action after all of this uh, kicks off the show. Tag team action. It is the Sea Stars getting to take on Willow Nightingale and Zoe Sky. Zoe Sky making her debut in MLW in the featherweight division. Uh, comments made about her physical size and being uh, probably the lightest in the featherweight division and almost being light enough to classify as her own division, uh, one lower than this as well, too. So kind of surprising that underselling the uh, size of Zoe Sky, uh, they did, in my opinion, really oversell her in-ring ability at the same time. I think they oversold it to a point where it didn't quite come across quite as strong. And maybe that has to do with being in a tag match, but it didn't look bad. I think her and Willow Nightingale worked reasonably well together for a put together tag team. The Sea Stars work great in tandem together. I like the two of them in that tag team aspect. Uh, I loved when Holiday pulled Willow Nightingale under the ring, which allowed the Sea Stars to take advantage, end up getting the victory. Great win for them without really jeopardizing Willow Nightingale, who we know seems to be one of the high spots of the featherweight division right now in MLW as well, and continues on that feud with Holiday as well, too. Uh, great stuff out of this one, Pop Smokes. What are your thoughts? I Yeah, I watched this match. I didn't love this match. It looked a little sloppy to me. I, I don't know what the situation is. I can't guess, but uh, there was some stuff I liked and some stuff I didn't like. Uh, you talked about Zoe Sky's uh, small stature. Yeah, they, they said she was 99 pounds at one point. That is a small wisp of a person for sure. And it, it's a little bit hard to uh, get your mind into believing that she's doing any kind of devastating offense here and there. But she obviously has been a wrestler for a number of years. She had some good stuff in this match. And, uh, you know, I think she uh, overall kind of rose above the uh, size differential in this match. Um, there was another few spots that I wasn't too sure about. It, same with the Philly crowd. It, it sounded very quiet during this. I, I hate to think that people still uh, go for popcorn or the bathroom during the ladies match, but it kind of really sounded like that's what happened here. Um, there was a spot where Zoe Sky uh, used her palm to push off instead of an Irish whip into the ropes. She pushed off Ashley Vox three times in the same spot uh, while they were running the ropes, and, and Vox did it once to her. I'm not a fan of these palm shoot-offs like that. It doesn't look believable. If you're going to throw the opponent into the ropes, give them an Irish whip. I mean, people have problems with an Irish whip looking believable in the first place, but a palm push-off like that, just laying your hand on the person's shoulder and kind of guiding them and, and then they just run of their own accord. I don't like those spots, especially three times in one spot, but uh, I'm just uh, nitpicking here a little bit. Um, I like Delmi Exo a whole bunch. She's big. She's strong. She's a pretty decent wrestler. 
I like Willow Nightingale a whole bunch. And uh, I also like the spot where, like you said, she's not made to look weak, but she's got this undead lunatic, hola dead, hiding under the ring that pushes, uh, pulls her underneath, allowing uh, the sea stars to hit that tidal wave finisher and get the pinfall. So yeah, uh, interesting. Glad to have a tag team match in this too. Uh, with the amount of women they have on their roster, I wasn't sure if they'd be able to throw too many tag team matches together and use the sea stars, but here we go. And, and the name team got the win. So nice for the sea stars. A little bit of uh, storyline building up here uh, again between the Holiday and Willow Nightingale. And uh, this match uh, achieved what it set out to do and uh, not too bad. Yeah, and you know what? The nice thing is, too, is they are going to be bringing in other teams. I believe at the most recent tapings in Philadelphia for Alpha, there was, in fact, uh, there was a tag team match that took place. I can't remember the opponents at this point in time, but we'll get to that when they show it on Fusion, of course. But the CSARs do have another tag team match coming up in the featherweight division. So good to see they are able to utilize that as well, too, from the two of them. And uh, be interesting to see where it can take the sea stars from there. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. And I mean, about the Irish whip, I think the other thing, too, is it comes down to size. And people say, oh, size doesn't matter in wrestling. And it can because you've got to make things look somewhat believable. And I remember listening in on a lesson one time before we were doing a show live in Saskatoon. And one of the guys talking about when you're a smaller guy taking on somebody a little bit bigger than you, the best way to do it is to grab them by the chest and grab them by the wrist push them back into the ropes like so, and then bring them into the whip kind of thing because it looks like you're more aggressive in that function, right? When you're trying to just flat out whip somebody that's a, that much physically bigger than you, it doesn't look as believable as if you're putting your weight into it and pushing them around in that sense. And more of that should be utilized. I thought that was a great lesson when I heard that myself. Yeah, for sure. And a smaller competitor like Zoe Sky would be, would be uh good to listen to a lesson like that i think another good way to do the whip is to take your hands like this just right around the wrist the right around the opponent's wrist and really lean into it and do a good pull to that 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 makes a good irish whip as well you bet it would so hopefully more of that to come again this is still a new division for mlw and a lot of these wrestlers yet to be on tv so again give them time i'm sure things will flush out and get even stronger in that division uh, up next, we had Alex Kane talking about how he's making a claim into the Opera Cup. He says that Tankman is definitely going to be out, and he knows it because him and King Mo sliced his forehead open last week on MLW Fusion. And we're we're not sure. The announcers aren't even sure if uh, Tankman's going to be back. But the answer came right afterwards. Alicia Toot then came on screen to let us know that Calvin Tankman is in training, preparing for his match against TJP in the semifinals of the Opera Cup. Again, there still seems to be something that needs that's going to get fleshed out in this whole one, Papa Smokes. Something is arise here. I think that uh, maybe if Tankman does make it to the match with TJP, who's to say Tankman doesn't win, then get taken out, and Kane goes straight into that finals match. Again, it's all speculation and booking at this point, but uh, your thoughts on these two little promos here? Yeah, good stuff. Uh, just only uh, asking more questions than answering them, really. Um, and I, yeah, like we've said in past weeks, I don't think they would have announced Alex Kane as an extra in this tournament if he wasn't going to somehow figure into it. And yeah, like you say, uh, if Tankman makes it to the match against TJP, who knows what might happen, but I, I still suspect that Alex Kane is going to get his way in there. And what better way to pump the tires of one of their newest talents uh, than having, you know, him slip into the opera cup and maybe, uh, maybe win the whole thing. And, wouldn't that be a feather in the cap of Alex Kane and, and MLW as a whole? And I think he, it's fairly clear by the way they're pushing him that they think very highly of this guy. He's got great skill and a great look, so I can see why they're doing it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if at the end of the uh, this year's Opera Cup to see Alex Kane holding it up. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to find out how that fleshes out. And we're going to find out how it fleshes out a little bit more in next week's episode, so we'll get back to that. Uh, in the meantime, that speaking of new guys, Alex Kane being one of them and his challenger for the evening being the other. So this is the Alex Kane prize fight open challenge. Him and King Mo come down to the ring. The fight is open to anybody who wants to take it up. The music hits and 
Warhorse makes his debut in MLW finally. Uh, he steps up to the plate here against Alex Kane. Whether that's a wise move, I'm not really too sure. I'm not sure how much I'd want a Brave getting in the ring with Alex Kane, but apparently Warhorse rules enough ass to go down there and show us what he's got. Uh, this was really my first real look into Warhorse. I know you've spoken highly of him, Papa Smokes. Uh, this guy's an interesting character. He carries himself in such a way that it's like normally this kind of goofiness would put me off, but there's enough there to make him interesting and fun that makes me still pay attention. He headbutts very interestingly well. I like so that he's got some very aggressive in ring maneuvers when he really get, uh, gets down to it. But obviously, Alex Kane, much more of an ass kicker. Uh, this one. Very competitive, more competitive than I even expected it to be. But Alex Kane coming out looking strong. Warhorse lo looked very strong coming out of this one, too, because this was not an easy task for Alex Kane to put him away. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% about what you said about Warhorse. It's normally not the kind of wrestler that would be my cup of tea. He's got a lot of uh, silliness and, 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 and uh, interactions with the crowd and stuff like that. And yet, he doesn't look like he's acting. It doesn't look like it's uh, like he's trying to put on another character. That is him, I think. And yeah. uh, he's out there having a good time. He likes some good metal just as I do. And uh, I kind of like this dude. I've been following him online for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I've been following him online and kind of getting a kick out of his stuff. And, and he does a bit of comedy ha ha here and there. And I don't seem to mind because he seems legit. And, and he, he's just, he's that guy and he's funny and he pulls it off, I think. Yeah, he seems to know when to take it serious and when to, you know, bring out a little bit of the comedy, which is a nice blend. It's something that MLW suits really well. So hopefully that'll be, we'll get to see some great things out of War Horse moving forward as well, too. Um, so yeah, it was a decent match. It did what it needed to do. Uh, afterwards, Alex Kane uh, up at the uh, ring apron says that no matter what, he is going to walk away with the 2021 Opera Cup. So he's making that statement, making that claim. He says the 2021 Opera Cup is going to be all his. Uh, I'll be interested to see how that pans out. Uh, next, we go to a backstage segment. Filthy Tom Lawler with Kevin Koo drawing up a game plan for the casket match. I got to say that I could have done without this segment, Bob Smokes. It came across a little overly silly, even for filthy Tom Lawler. It seemed like Kevin Koo was not the guy to sell the craziness of what Tom Lawler was putting down in this one. It seemed really displaced and just not worthy of being on the show, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, I can't argue there. Um, I think what they wanted to do was, uh, yeah, feature uh, filthy Tom on a couple of his last appearances, apparently in MLW, which is, of course, sad to hear. They wanted to have the little spot where Kevin Koo quits Team Filthy so that uh, apparently he will continue in MLW as uh, on his own. Uh, Dominic Guarini, we were wondering about him a couple weeks ago. I've heard that he had a medical condition of some yeah. kind, has been out, has either been sick or injured in some way. So he hasn't been doing matches. And uh, yeah, Team Filthy in shambles right now. Their leader, Tom, uh, uh, is finish, finishing up with MLW. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of sad. I've been enjoying Lawler quite a lot, but um, it's clear that he wants to uh, do other things elsewhere. And, uh, yeah, so we're kind of tying up the loose ends on MLW here and uh, getting ready for his departure. We might have to start reviewing Filthy Tom Lawler matches coming out of New Japan Pro Wrestling moving forward there, Pop Smokes, because yeah. he's been kicking some major ass over in Japan right now. So curious to see if that's going to continue on. And to all you New Japan Pro Wrestling fans, Make sure that you check out MLW because that is where a lot of talents like Filthy Tom Lawler have made their names for themselves. Uh, after this, we were saved by a Joseph Samael promo because he can save just about anything on any show. Uh, he refers to the United States of propaganda and that he is the real El Jefe. He is saying that he is going to be the boss and he's got an army ahead of him. And he basically throwing shade at Cesar Duran by the looks of it. Yeah, it's just more greatness from Joseph Samuel. I know that you also enjoy every time he's on there. He's such a master of the promo, too, and uh, he's promising to destroy uh, Hammerstone, and, and, and he wants M all of MLW to bow to him. So, uh, again, they're starting to uh, uh, really get into a deep dive about uh, the 
the inner workings of Contra unit uh, as to uh, how much power Samael has over a, a ham, uh, over Fatu, pardon me. And uh, yes, Samael seems uh, constant in his, uh, in the mindset that he's had over the past couple of years that uh, the army of Contra is building and will go on and will eventually take over MLW. So. Whatever else is going on, Samael's uh, vision is not uh, changing in any way. Yes, I agree. And uh, yeah, great save from him. But then uh, in some ways, another segment came up afterwards that I could have probably done without too. I know that uh, Holiday does some goofy segments. It can be funny at times. I think maybe there's been too much of the goofy on his side now, especially now that they've kind of leaned him more towards a baby face. Uh, I, I would have thought, to expect more like frustration and anger of the beatdown that he suffered at the hang of, ha, ha, oh, sorry at the hands of King Muertes that was put on by Cesar Duran, but it seems more like he's just gone right back into that making calls, being the goof kind of thing, the class clown. And back here, he's with uh, Alicia backstage saying that he's, you know, scored all these deals. So he's got all his fans around the world, and now he scored this big deal out of Japan. He wants to show off his Japanese candy to Alicia too. He opens the door and Tajiri is in there eating all of the Japanese candy backstage. Uh, I know that they're trying to really push for this link between MLW and all Japan pro wrestling, but this was not a good way to put that link together. In my opinion, I would have liked to see something better done. And, you know, no mention even that Tajiri is the MLW middleweight championship. That championship since it's been won has virtually disappeared from the memory of mlw all of a sudden yeah and i agree with you i couldn't uh i didn't even really understand this segment or this skit it, it wasn't funny uh, it didn't push anybody it's i suppose it's fun to have a glimpse at tajiri once in a while as we all remember him from 15 20 years ago kind of thing but I didn't get a tickle out of this. I didn't get a chuckle out of it. Um, I don't know what's going on with Holiday and all his uh, assing around. But, the, you know, he had the simple beat down and then he had his face wrapped in, in bandages. But you could kind of see that there was no injuries on him. I, I don't know what this stuff is. I think Richard Holiday is a great wrestler and a great promo. He's above this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is him that is pushing to do this kind of thing or if the, uh, you know, the booking booker or booking committee are getting him to do this sort of thing. But uh, I, I feel like MLW as a show is above these kind of cheap comedy skits, too. And uh, I'd like a little less of those, actually. Yeah, especially to get kind of like two in a row, like only broken up by a Joseph Samuel promo. It seemed very heavy on the goofiness at this point in time. And just, yeah, and especially the, knowing that we're leading into another gimmick match, despite it being between two guys that are really good inside the ring. Um, yeah, again, we're, we're being left with another gimmick match, and they're getting a little bit overdone right now, not only in pro wrestling, but in MLW as well, too. I mean, this was the company that didn't overdo the gimmicky matches too often, and it seems in the last few weeks they're seeping in quite frequently. Uh, speaking of which, we get to our main event, the casket match between Filthy Tom Lawler and King Muertes for the Caribbean Championship. Uh, so Muertes, once he comes out, he ends up being joined by, they say, Carly Perez, uh, also known as Katrina from Lucha Underground Days. So she was the assistant to Mil Muertes back in the Lucha Underground Days. So again, tying back those uh, those days to the MLW crowd right now. So obviously the crowd on hand seemed to really understand what was going on. They knew who exactly who this was uh, as she seemed to get quite the reaction once she revealed the robe and everything like that, that it was her. Uh, so this was a nice one-on-one -on -one match. The match itself inside the ring, take away all the gimmick portion of it. They allowed this one to mostly go with a nice match inside the ring. And that aspect of it was fantastic. These two guys can go really well. This was a really decently put together match, I'd have to say, in the end. Although that poor casket really took more of a shit kicking than the competitors did it most time. If I'm not mistaken, the lids of the casket actually fell off of their hinges, and the poor guys at ringside had to lift them back up in order to put them over top at the very end of the matchup, uh, of which Bill Mortez uh, getting the uh, victory here over. Uh, Filthy Tom Waller. Uh, so, yes, the casket took a beating. The competitors took a beating. 
King Ward is successful, and this pretty much, I think, is the nail in the coffin, for a lack of better words, for uh, Filthy Tom Lawler's run in MLW. Uh, I got to say, a great run for what I've seen of Filthy Tom Lawler. I will miss him on the MLW shows. Uh, if this is how he goes out, at least it was in a very respectful way and to an opponent of equal or greater value, in my opinion. Yeah, and this match, uh, despite it being Lawler's last match, was meant to put over King Muertes, mm -hmm. which it did nicely. Muertes uh, controlled most of this match with a lot of power moves, a lot of brawling moves, as he usually does. But I like this segment for the way... Um, Carly Perez seems to elevate King Muertes a little bit for all the, for all the, uh, uh, you know, adornments that he has the cool mask and the cool outfit for the entrance and everything. I always felt like he needed something else. You know what I mean? I wasn't sure what that was, May, you know, a prop or something, but I, this is what it is. I think is Carly yeah. Perez very beautiful young lady kind of steps into that role that Selena De La Renta used to have on this show. She's experienced with it. She's already been on TV in a similar role. Uh, she's got the whole witchy woman kind of thing going on, which is neat to, which fits perfectly with King Muertes. And I like this a lot. Now it seems like she's got some control over him, but that's for the better kind of thing. And I think uh, Mil Muertes is going to be a better a uh, wrestler, a more fearsome competitor with Carly Perez by his side. And uh, we just saw a uh, filthy Tom, uh, a, a former champion, a uh, top uh, competitor in MLW, do the job for King Muertes and, and perfect. It, it elevates him. It, it gives him a win against the former champion. It gives him a successful title defense of that Caribbean title. And uh, this whole thing looked great, I thought. Yeah, he and he does look fantastic, and you're right. She is the uh, piece of the puzzle that's missing. I like how they kind of played a little bit on the MLW crowd, making maybe some believe that this was actually Selena De La Renta making her return to MLW, but in fact, the reveal ends up being that this is Carly Perez. I think this is going to be a great pairing, and clearly that the plan is for King Muertes to become one of the top heels in MLW after this win over Filthy Tom Waller. This really has to escalate him to the top. And I'm trying to think about his run so far with MLW, and I think maybe his only loss so far has been to Alexander Hammerstone. And again, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Alexander Hammerstone has obviously been kicking ass and taking names for the last couple of years in MLW. So again, no, no harm in King Muertes having that be his only defeat so far in MLW. He looks great. I can't wait to see what they do with him next. And don't forget in that match, he took the nightmare pendulum uh, just at almost 300 pounds when uh, Hammerstone delivered that pendulum to him. Boy, that looked good. <laughs> was, so yeah. loud, so impactful. And that, that was really, really good stuff. Probably one of my favorite moments of wrestling this year, just about. That was fucking awesome. Uh, so moving on from there, we're going to get to MLW Fusion Episode 8 now, Pop Smokes. And this one, if there was a little bit of a mess on Fusion Episode 7, this one took mess and turned it upside down on its head. Ooh, this is going to be tough to get through with uh, being respectful at the same time. Because guess what? MLW, we love you guys, but we're going to give you the hard truth every once in a while. Uh, this one starts off with Backstage, Hammer, and Duca, and Holiday. Um, and Duca kind of gets his little say in. You got Hammer that's saying he's just taking a bite out of his uh, power bar or whatever it is he's eating. Holiday's off making some sort of phone call. He's saying something on the line that, well, I don't know, Sting hasn't been over since he was with the police. Kind of funny, I guess, but none of this gelled well together at this point in time. And then Cesar Duran comes into the mix. He comes in saying that these guys need one more teammate, which, again, I wonder why these guys haven't really shown any efforts to find a teammate and now i'm also questioning one more teammate i thought this was supposed to be five on five and now they're talking they need one more guy when there's only three of them a little confused about that there uh from there he that uh, cesar duran saying that he has got somebody he, he wants to end contra he's got someone and he has a key that will unlock this person for these guys there is a whole slew of ideas being thrown around out there about who this is who cesar duran has in mind I personally have a feeling this might tie back to the box that was given to King Huertes back in Cesar Duran's office after he was talking about opportunity. 
Uh, it could be that. Some people have also speculated about uh, there was a guy that was portrayed as the brother of Cesar Duran and also a very vicious, large individual that was very uncontrollable back in the Lucha Underground days and that there could be speculation of him making his way to MLW. Either way, um, I'd say this one was messy, made more sense towards the end once Cesar Duran came in. Uh, your thoughts on the opening segment for episode eight? Yeah, this didn't do it for me whatsoever. Um, the skit was, again, not funny, kind of confusing. I, I knew they were trying to push storylines, so I was trying to listen, but I I, I don't know, man. Uh, the one thing about Holiday's phone call is that he was pretending to talk to Maxwell Jacob Friedman because he called him Max at the beginning. Mm, so, you know, yeah, I realized yeah. you're busy. So maybe you can't come back and make War Chamber, but uh, blah, blah. Sort of funny, I guess. Like, uh, I don't know if Friedman would still take Holiday's calls anymore, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that's neither here nor there. But uh, yeah, I, I also have some speculation about uh, what Caesar Duran meant about the fifth guy on their team or fourth guy we do discover later in this episode that there has been a fourth guy added mm -hmm. already but i don't think we knew at this time no not the, so, my recollection uh, at all yeah I, i'm trying not to spoil the, any surprise for later like i sometimes do but uh <laughs> we do we do figure out the fourth guy later on but i don't know who this was it was a mess um i really think they should stick to uh sports-based wrestling try and get rid of a couple of these skits and fit another match in there, or fit some uh, kind of promo packages in there. The skits just aren't doing it for me, but I, I see kind of why they have to do that. They can't do separate promos for the main event of war chamber because it's a five on five man match. And they, you know, I mean, there's just not time to do five or 10 promos to do that. So they're trying to do some stuff with the guys together, but it's just, it's turning out a little bit clumsy and, uh, yeah, I hope this tightens up in the in the next few weeks. Yeah, I really do too. And then from there, if you thought that was not good, oh boy, the first match of the evening, this was a train wreck and a half. Um, this was announced by the guys as a trios match to start off. And I'm like, oh shit, we got Los Parks versus 5150. Brilliant. This should be fantastic. Then all of a sudden they cut to a segment of Fatu losing his shit backstage. Not really sure why. Still, I don't know much ever unfolds from this whole thing other than Fatu's pissed off about not getting his title shot, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, then all of a sudden, we get two members of Los Parks. We get the sons of L.A. Park, Elo to L.A. Park, and L.A. Park Jr. come out. So I'm like, where's L.A. Park? This was supposed to be a trios match. WTF. Then uh, all of a sudden, 5150 come out, and it's announced Rivera and Slice Boogie. So... Tag match, 2v2, but now there's a trios match. I'm really confused here, Papa Smokes, at this point. Still scratching my head. Uh, 5150 coming out acting like the baby faces, despite all their tactics so far being very heel-like in nature. I mean, I, they are getting a pop from the Philly crowd, and that's kind of expected from that in particular audience. But again, nothing 5150 does otherwise is baby face. I know Lowe's Parks aren't baby face either, but man, there seem to be a whole lot of like, you know, play into the crowd and really uh, going and clapping hands with people in the audience and stuff for what's supposed to be a new heel faction, in my opinion. Uh, from there, all of a sudden, right in the middle of the match, Homicide comes out to a massive pop, and suddenly we have a 3v2 matchup on our hands. And then LA Park comes out, it's 3v3. Now it's a trios match. I guess they're trying to sell the idea that Homicide was attacking LA Park backstage. Really not sure how that could have happened without the others getting involved or anything like that. You think LA park would be with his sons at any given time, right before a matchup. This one broke out into all sorts of chaos, tables, chairs, more chaos. I hate to use the words lazy booking, but lazy booking. I'm sorry. This was not what I wanted out of these two teams. I know that the chaos led to a no contest and I would have been fine with a no contest between the teams themselves had it not turned into the big schmozzle that it did, um, because I want to see it prolonged. I like everybody involved. I just really, really disliked what they did here. Okay, that's totally fair. Um, I'm trying to think of what they were trying to do here, too, and I think it's just 
I think they're pushing this feud as as a knockdown, drag out brawl from start to finish kind of thing. Like these teams never really did get in the ring and wrestle. In the two times we've seen them uh, bump into each other, it's been all brawling outside the ring, tables, chairs, bells, whistles, all that kind of stuff. Um, when I was also confused about the trios match at the beginning, also when I saw those parks come out, I thought, okay the third guy's hiding under the ring like he always is. And then uh, when LAX came out with just the two guys, I thought, well, maybe Julian Smokes is going to, or Julius Smokes is going to be the wrestler in it, but he doesn't really strike me as an in-ring wrestler. Uh, he, he does his stuff on the outside and that's about it. Yeah, this this was a bit of a mess. I, you know, the brawling was good to a certain extent and they fought out in the crowd. You could see that the Philly, uh, TV taping crowd was quite into this. You know, you've got yeah. the wrestlers right on your lap and right in front of you and doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, that's that's really fun for the live fans to watch on TV. It's slightly less fun for sure, but um, I don't know. I think they're just going for a feeling of complete uh, mayhem with these two teams so that uh, whenever the uh, eventual title match is going to take place, that uh, the fans kind of have an idea of what to look for is that it's going to be uh, just absolute brawling, uh, both teams cheating, both teams taking advantage of the referee, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it's, there's nothing fancy about that kind of uh, setup, but that appears to be what they're doing. And if it gets executed well uh, in their eventual uh, title match, then that's good. But some of this looks pretty sloppy. Yeah, we got to say, I, I could take a hard pass on this. But again, I'm not taking a hard pass on the feud itself. I do still have high hopes. I like everybody involved with it. And I still think that we can get uh, some great stuff out of these two teams. Uh, from there, Joseph Samuel, save the day. Uh, here he comes in. Uh, he's basically uh, talking about, uh, well, basically cutting down Hammer's team, talking about uh, Duran backing Hammer's team at the same time, scoffing at the idea of it. Um, he's really charged up and PO'd in this one in particular, Papa Spokes. He had some very choice uh, negative things to say about each of the individuals, Hammerstone, EJ and Duca, and Richard Holiday. All very comical. I have uh, you know, I got to say, anyone should go back and watch this just for watching how to deliver a promo that sounds like a guy who means every word of what he said about these dudes. Yeah, he called Richard Holiday a, a coddled rich boy, panty yeah. waist. <laughs> I haven't heard that one in a long time. That, that one really got me laughing. And yeah. I think Daniel's the best. Oh, go on. Oh, I was going to say, I'm wasn't in Duca dipshit, dipshit or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a grain of truth to all of that for sure. But uh, Samuel, again, yeah, can save the day anytime. He he can pull these great promos out of his back pocket seemingly, and he's always got one ready to go. Good stuff. The leader of Contra never disappoints. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next up, we saw backstage that the brawl continues between 5150 and Los Parks. And Joe, all of a sudden, sorry, uh, Jacob Fatu runs through the scene, charged up and angry himself, too, as if he kind of just happened to walk right through the area and they happened to be going on. I mean, OK, <laughs> that's a, that's all I can say. OK, but it it did what it needs to, I guess. So uh, from there, let's talk about the next match, because this yikes, um, this both had. A couple of highlights and then had a lot of low lights for me on this one. I think it did nothing for anybody. The survival elimination match. One side, we've got the Beast Man uh, as accompanied by Kim Chi. We had Kevin Koo, Gino Medina, Casey Navarro. Again, didn't those two just take each other on a few weeks ago? Seems kind of weird. They're teaming yeah. up now. Uh, you got Akiro Kwan and King Mo on this side. The other side, we got our boy Zenshi there. We got Warhorse, Savio Vega. Go figure. Blue Meanie, I guess they just ran out of guys backstage that they could call up that night. Sorry to the Blue Meanie, but that seemed like a we had nobody else on the card. Uh, Richard Holiday and EJ and Duca. I guess this was their way of getting Holiday and Duca and Akira Kwan involved in a matchup prior to the War Chamber match itself, and that was seen in the way that it was laid out and how it finished off and everything like that as well, too. Um, highlights, Nduka looks good. Uh, he basically toppled over everybody in the match. 
I think if you wanted in Duca to look strong, you could have done this in a similar fashion, having him take on two members of the Sentai Death Squad or even go in one-on-one with, say, somebody who's not in the War Chamber match, like a Davari or somebody like that, I think would have been a better placement for EJ and Duca at this point leading into the War Chamber match. Uh, this one, yeah, I mean, we had some highlight fun from our boy Zenchi. I mean, of course, he's an aerial acrobatic. He's fantastic at doing that stuff. Uh, Beast Man got some uh, decent little spots in there as well, too. Uh, you know, aside from that, it just came across comical. It came across silly. And it really, in my opinion, didn't really do anything to escalate anybody except for Nduka. And really, I don't think Nduka looked amazing coming out of this one as he would going in something more one-on-one-ish. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the the first three minutes of this match I watched, I kind of got the sense of what it was going to be like because in the first three minutes, three guys were eliminated with one move apiece. Yeah. And these are these are uh, upper mid-card guys. Like, it was uh, War Horse, King, Mo, and Kevin Koo that each got eliminated just by a single spine buster at the very beginning of the match. This doesn't ring true to me. Um, none of those guys would have been pinned by one move that fresh at the beginning of this match. Yeah. I'm not trying to split hairs. I'm not trying to say it's not realistic enough or anything. But in fact, this this didn't go over so well. Um, it was a bit of a schmozzle and a mess of a match. Uh, Beastman ended up looking good in this. Uh, I liked the Zenshi versus Navarro segment. They had some hot stuff going yeah. on. Some nice Lucha, some real good flips. That turned out awesome. That's a good match you could highlight in the future. But yeah, uh, a six-on-six six elimination match with only you know 10 or 15 minutes to get it done on TV is just not really turning my crank. Uh, I realized they wanted to make Nduka look strong as they did in the battle riot as well. He had the most eliminations and all that, but I'm starting to wonder if Nduka is as good as I thought he was initially, or as, as good as they kind of make him out to be because they keep having to give him these matches of, of intense squashing kind of thing. And, uh, I think if he was as good as, as we kind of thought he was at the beginning, they could just be giving him some matches against quality opposition and we could see him do this stuff. But instead, he's spine bustering multiple dudes over and over again and getting pinfalls in it. It kind of just has that that smell of like an ultimate warrior push or something like that where uh, they're just going to smash him over regardless of everything else. And uh in a big hurry to do it before war chamber. And, uh, you know, I can only assume that he's going to be up to more of that at war chamber too. And, uh, I'm sometimes suspicious of these guys that, that need the big smash over like that. Yeah. And I, I'm with you on that as well, too. I mean, I, I like Nduka. He's got a great look and he looked fantastic in the battle riot, but they have kept him very quiet outside of the in-ring stuff ever since. And this is kind of our first glimpse in and, I don't know if it was he was getting gassed or again it comes down to it being hot in that arena and guys get slippery but even the final spine buster that he pulled off there looked like he almost lost his opponent and couldn't quite hook the leg enough to get that three pin uh three count as well too so yeah. looking a little rough there for EJ and Duca so again I don't know if this really did much especially going into a big match like the battle riot again if you want to protect this guy you got to make sure that he looks strong going in because this is a big dude and if you want him protected you got to make sure that you protect what weaknesses he might have and I don't want to say weaknesses in a negative way I mean it in a AJ and Duca is still very new to professional wrestling. There's still a lot of years of experience that he needs to get under his belt before he can be that top level guy. And I think that it's going to show if they push him too far, like you said, uh, you know, a la the ultimate warrior kind of thing. And hopefully that doesn't end up being the case. I really hope not. I do hope for good things for EJ and Duca. He seems like a great dude. He's got a great uh, physical uh, size to him and stuff like that got in great shape and I think he looks like a star and I think that would be why MLW wants to push this guy to the top but again make sure that you do the push authentically and that you don't uh, just cram this guy down everybody's throats because we know how fast wrestling tur- turns on guys when that is done too so but uh, moving on from there we go to a backstage segment Willow Nightingale with Cesar Duran 
Uh, Cesar Duran starts to tell Willow Nightingale that he knows that she's friends with a lot of her competitors, which she then cuts off and says she's familiar with Duran's work. She's a big fan of him and everything, and she is not there to make friends. She wants to be there to not only win the featherweight championship in MLW, but to make the featherweight championship in MLW. I thought for the amount of time on screen, this was well done. Uh, this w- put over Willow Nightingale in a nice way. I liked that she said that she's not here to make the friends. Yeah, she's friends with some of these women, but if it means cutting them in order to get to that championship and make that championship worthwhile, she's going to do it. I liked this from Willow. I was interrupted, of course, by Cesar Duran's uh, lucha sidekick there, telling him that there's something up with Jacob Fatu, and he said to get Jacob Fatu into his office. But again, this for Willow Nightingale looked really good. It was shortened to the point and got her again on screen time like they've been doing week after week. For sure. I I agree with that. And I also thought it was interesting. Him, uh, uh, Caesar Duran, basically uh, kind of fancying her as going to be the first women's featherweight champion in MLW. But if you remember last episode, Duran has a meeting with Holodead and instead of uh, suspending her, fining her for interfering in that tag match, he said he was going to bonus her out for showing uh, 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 a predis- pre- predisposition to violence or something to that effect. Anyway, he liked her uh, inventive violence. So he's bonusing out her, her enemy, her uh, feud partner, so to speak. And he's kind of like, cooing in her ear about how she might be the first uh, ladies champion and he likes her and he's excited to work with her and he wants to work with her so again question marks surrounding Cesar Duran and his uh, allegiances what what he's up to what his ultimate plan is and uh, and uh, it looks like he's playing both sides of the coin here too and we're gonna have to see what happens he's gonna get found out at some point you bet. Uh, so speaking of Cesar Duran, we go to his office after this where Fatu is absolutely losing his mind. He's throwing shit around. He's grabbing a hold of the assistant there in the Lucha Mask. Who, you know, that guy is a big fucking dude himself, too. I wonder why he has got himself involved more. Uh, but from there, he Cesar Duran comes in. He tries to calm the situation. Fatu says, he, you know, I want my title. My, in fact, the words were, give me my title fight mu- Title fight, motherfucker, was exactly the words out of Fatu's mouth. And to which Cesar Duran cleverly says that there was a a, a, a pact put in place back when J- uh, Jacob Fatu was the heavyweight champion by Joseph Samael. And he basically throws Joseph Samael under the bus here, saying that it is Joseph Samael who has not signed off on the agreement to have the rematch between Jacob Fatu and Alexander Hammerstone. Now, it seems to me like Cesar Duran is trying to put a very big wrench into Contra right now, and he's doing a fantastic job of it. He's maybe put a little bit doubt into the mind of Mods Kruger recently, and now he's doing so with Jacob Fatu. Again, two big boys going into this war chamber that he has now have them maybe putting a little bit of doubt towards their leader. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting too? And uh, Cesar Duran has taken his, an interest in Mods Kruger. He seems to see a whole bunch of potential in him, which could also mean that uh, Kruger might just be useful to Duran in, in doing some of his errands for him. It seems like Duran doesn't uh, approve of Contra Unit in MLW having as much power as they do. So it does seem like he's trying to. Uh, internally disrupt Contra from the inside out. And uh, I'm interested to see where this goes because, uh, yeah, like you say now, he's casting doubt upon uh, the uh, intentions of Joseph Samael. And uh, to put a a wedge between Samael and Fatu would be really uh, breaking up one of the crucial partnerships in, in, in MLW wrestling from the uh, longtime former champion and his manager and partner kind of thing. And uh, I really wonder, I think a lot of this is going to come to a head of War Chamber when everybody's all together. And uh, I, I kind of have the feeling that, that Kruger is, uh, is the key to all this. Uh, no pun intended, when he showed the key earlier too, I was thinking of uh, Mods Kruger, that somehow he's going to be uh, the, the tipping point in that War Chamber match, I think. But uh I don't really want to speculate. I'd rather just uh, watch it as it occurs. But uh, again, many questions without answers. 
You bet. And, you know, we talked about earlier about that uh, fourth man on Hammer's team earlier in the night. Uh, I think we'll uh, maybe just take this moment for you to say it, Papa Smokes, because I forgot to write it down. So I'm going to turn to you. Who is the fourth member of the Hammerheads? I believe they added Savio Vega to that team. That's so, uh, right. They did too. That one made me kind of go. Hmm? I don't know if they ever actually announced it or it kind of just came up uh, as they were talking about it. I, I remember kind of being surprised myself like, Oh, I thought there was still two guys to name. And then all of a sudden they had Vega in there. So uh, not sure what's going on. Maybe a little uh, blooper for that, but uh, yeah, interesting. And I, I, it is, I, I, have respect for Salvio Vega, but is is he of the uh, mustard to team up with uh, Hammer and the rest of the Hammerheads there? Like, I don't know. I was kind of expecting someone a little more current, you know? Yeah, and, you know, being that it was two spots that they've had open for so long, I kind of had a feeling that all of a sudden the Von Ericks were going to be team Hammerheads here. I really was expecting it. I thought that would have been a cool addition to their team and quite interesting at the same time, but I guess not. Uh, we'll... Uh, Wait even longer to see an appearance from the Vaughn Ericks again. I, I've really been missing those boys. Come on back, boys. Yeah. Um, from there, we had our main event of the evening. And thank you, thank you, thank you for this main event because this to me saved this episode of MLW in so many ways. Uh, this was the semifinal match in the Opera Cup tournament. Bobby Fish taking on Davey Richards. I'll just say it, this one had wrestling, it had intensity, it had good selling, it had a sharpshooter, and despite the the guys on uh, commentary saying that that was the Scorpion, oh wait, never mind the sharpshooter, I will forgive them, but only barely, because you do not call that the Scorpion Deathlock before you call it a sharpshooter. Um, Davey Richards picking up a win by tap out, this one was fantastic, everything I expected from these two guys. I could watch these two guys wrestle anytime, man. This one was awesome. Yeah, this was a main event. There's no other way to put it. This was a main event match. And the commentators filled us in on a lot of the background stuff about how Fish had used to, had formerly trained with Davey Richards or under him kind of thing and then went out on his own. And you could see that this was going to be a, not really a style clash, but a, a two similar styles going to battle each other with uh, martial arts, MMA kind of tactics, and then just wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. This was really, really good. I like this match a lot. Nothing terribly fancy in this. It started out slow. The guys uh, felt each other out a little bit, kind of threw some tentative kicks and a few holds being applied but with reversals and escapes and some nice looking chain wrestling going on here uh it the match picked up when they hit the floor now the strikes are coming in fish is throwing those high section roundhouse kicks uh richard's uh brawling along the uh the fan uh, railway there and all that richard's uh, had his leg hurt at some point in this uh in this exchange so fish took over once they got back in the ring slowing it down again even more with methodical striking uh and uh leg locks working on that leg of course it did get forgotten at some point and richards was doing his running spots with no uh pain evidence yeah. in that leg but i again i'm not I, I don't care about that this was a really good match um there was i liked uh I like the kind of old school wrestling style of both of these guys, both of these guys, a lot of joint manipulation, the bending the fingers, bending the wrists, which is uh, some of the little bits of that are allowed in most professional wrestling rule books, but that is pretty dirty fighting. And uh, I, I like the intensity of the both guys were willing to use stuff like that. Um, yeah. And eventually uh, fish gets the, the uh, heel hook on or the fish hook as he likes to call it richards uh, uh in tremendous pain won't tap gets to the ropes and everything and then hits that brain buster on bobby fish gets him in the ankle lock in the middle fish kind of almost made it to the ropes a couple of times but you know when he gets dragged into the middle like that and then the scissors put on the legs oh it's over and yeah fish had no point or no uh no uh no option but to t tap out in this match. You he, he had it hard and uh, risks uh, serious injury to try and stay in it for longer. So uh, 
nice match, nice uh, submission at the end of it, and then some uh, some sportsmanship afterwards. Now, this is a, something that's used in a lot of matches nowadays. I think it's used much too much, but in in a sp- uh, just doing it once in a while like this, uh, just when there's a match where the guys used to be friends, they aren't anymore, but they have the mutual respect and all that. That's the kind of match where I can see a tentative handshake and a hug and a pat on the back at the end. This makes sense to me. So this was a nice touch after this match. Just don't do it too much. That's right. And you know what? I, I got to recall a bit of what we were talking about earlier about the you know push of EJ and Duca. I think the push of... Davy Richardson's coming to MLW has been a lot more authentic and a lot more interesting. He has beaten top guys. I mean, top, top guys since coming to MLW. I mean, filthy Tom Lawler. I mean, now he's taking out Bobby Fish. He's going to the Opera Cup 2021 finals here. We don't know who he's going to be against, but it should be interesting nonetheless. I like Davy Richards a whole lot. I like this match a whole lot. I haven't seen a bad thing from Davey Richards yet. I think uh, his matches have been a very big highlight of MLW as of late, and I'm very much looking forward to the finals coming up very soon as well, too. Uh, after this, uh, even though this was the main event, we had a little bit of a backstage segment there with the Hammerheads once again, and an announcement that Richard Holiday is going to be given a MLW championship match against Alexander Hammerstone, almost trying to throw a wrench now into the Hammerheads plan. And then they started talking about... Uh, the, you know, it's kind of how this would pan out with the booking and with them going to embrace and a friendly hug after. And then all of a sudden, Holiday giving a clothesline to Hammer and turning on him and Hammer not being sure of what had just went down and Holiday kicking him down and holding up the title. Uh, this came across silly. <laughs> Again, silly after a, such a solid main event matchup should have really ended the show, in my opinion. And then it made me start to think for a minute. Now, they are alluding to something here, and it makes me wonder, is this where they're going with EJ and Duca? Would it be possible that EJ and Duca takes the turn on these guys? Uh, so as I was saying, yeah, it makes me wonder about, could this be something they're alluding to with EJ and Duca? I guess we'll have to wait and see, but that's pretty much uh, it for MLW Fusion Alpha Episode 7 and 8 there, Pop Smokes. Anything else that you want to add here tonight? No, I just wanted to agree with you just after that great uh, main event title match that skit at the end really had me scratching my head i I wasn't sure if they were serious that this was a title match the guys weren't taking it seriously like uh, even if they're friends i would expect hammerstone to have it announced to him that he's got a new challenger to his belt and it's holiday i would expect some bristling of the of the hairs on the neck and some uh, guys puffing up on each other a little bit or something like that and uh, they were just assing around and making a joke out of it. And this this reminds me of the stuff I don't like on other uh, wrestling TV shows uh, that are current to this. And uh, no, nah, don't don't like it. It's it's you said it before. It's lazy booking. I don't know what they're trying to get across with this, but it's not getting across, and it's uh, it's making the whole program kind of look weaker. I think. Yeah, it really does. And it doesn't really pump a person up for the War Chamber match either, because it does. If they're not taking this seriously, are they going to take the War Chamber match seriously? Where you got someone like Joseph Samael, who he's taking it seriously. So is Fatu, and so is Mods Kruger. They're looking strong going into this. Well, Hammerheads, team, sorry, the Hammerheads, they have their team looks like they just, oh, we'll just be, we'll be there. We'll see what happens. And, you know, I, we're yeah. going to see a shit kicking if that's the case. But we'll uh, we'll find out, I guess, next week, MLW Fusion on Thanksgiving. Uh, it's unfortunate these episodes not as strong as some of the earlier ones in the season. But again, hey, that's just our opinion and shit happens. Whatever. It's free TV. We enjoy MLW. So despite maybe not loving these two episodes, still, thank you, MLW, for what you do for us. Uh, that's going to be everything for us here today on the Video Bros Network and on Ring Respect Radio. Make sure to click subscribe down below. Turn on that notification bell so you know when we release new material here on the Video Bros Network. And reach out to us anytime. We love to talk wrestling. And if you've got something you want us to go over and review, send it our way. We'd love to hear from you. So for myself and Papa Smokes, take care. Have a good night. And we'll see you soon.